much. How does one follow the Beatles and Beethoven? And they told me I didn't need slides, but of course I wasn't clever enough to think of audio <laughs> clips. Um, I'm going to do my best to channel a very important mentor in my life, Professor David Foote. He's already been mentioned, and how can you have a discussion about millennials and boomers without Professor Foote? He was my professor when I was in graduate school here at the University of Toronto. I think some of the insights that he embedded in my mind will find uh, a voice here. First thing I want to set up for you is the gloomy part of my talk. I, I'm going to mention, I'm going to basically make the case that we are in for a low growth future, low economic growth future. Now for some of you that might be a positive thing. There's many people who link economic growth to the degradation of our environment and so on, so this could be a positive thing. But if you're looking to find a job and you're entering a labor market, economic growth kind of matters because it's where the generation of new jobs come from. They tend to. And so if I'm arguing that this low growth is a part of our future, uh, where's the silver lining? So I'll, I'll, that will be the end of my talk, hopefully, the silver lining in that story. But to get you there, I need to convince you that we're in for a low growth future. To understand that, we have to understand our high growth past. When was the period of economic boom in Canada? Hands up. 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s, which for many uh, countries was not the high growth period. It was a period of stagflation. But kind of Canada had high inflation, but it had enough growth to compensate for that. We had 30 years, roughly, um, from the end of World War II, or three decades anyway, in which our growth surpassed that of most industrialized nations. During that time, we built universities. 30 plus universities were built between that post-war period. 20 alone in the 1960s. 20 new public universities built in the 1960s. Now you know why you could get a job as a professor with just an MA, right, in the 1960s. Now, now go back. So that was an unparalleled growth, both public and private, innovation. It might have benefited fewer people. Anyone who's watched Mad Men know that it was a male-centered economy still. Labor force participation rates of women were lower than they are today, and their roles were segregated. Fine, there is a caveat, a major one. But by and large, newcomers to Canada did very well uh, when they immigrated during that time period, 1950s, 60s, and 70s, which I'm um, relating to here. What's the demographic connection? Well, there's something called a demographic dividend that's been um, mentioned in economic development literature and the labor literature. What this means is that an industrialized country like Canada can take advantage of a period of unprecedented demographic growth, i.e. the baby boom, um, because of all the transformations that, that brings. There aren't many instances. There was a baby boom in the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, but Canada was still forming as a country, so that was Britain's benefit. And there was a second baby boom that happened after World War II. That's it. Those are only two instances in human history that we have to go on. Uh, and I'm a kind of an empirical scientist, so I know two instances means an N, a sample of two. I know it's not much to go on, but there are other countries that have experienced baby booms, either sometimes artificially, take China, the one-child policy that they instituted in the early 1980s, late 70s, led to an unprecedented demographic dividend. They went from very high birth rates to very low very quickly, and that's what happened in Canada's baby boom, a period of skyrocketing birth rates after World War II, and then kind of very rapid declines after the mid-60s. That growth, that generation of baby boomers that slowly, actually pretty fast, started entering the labor market is what I contend generated most of that economic growth that fueled Canada through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Think of every major event in, in, um, in your life and cast it as a sort of cycle. It can be delayed. Some generations do things later, some do them earlier, but we all follow a life cycle of needs. We're born we need to be cared for, we get educated, we enter the workforce, we borrow to buy a house, buy a car, we then begin to save, we work even more, and we retire, and then we pass away. The cycle repeats itself. That life cycle of needs is indicative of certain changes that happen in every economy. Now, if you marry that idea that we all go through a life cycle of needs, we have children during that life cycle too. Um, many of us, we marry. That life cycle combined with a huge growth in the population is what can produce these signal changes in a society. The birth rates of 
the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, which maxed out at 480,000 births. It's the largest number of single births in 1959. It's the peak of the baby boom. That generation went through the life cycle of needs. So if you kind of plan out, when did we have our fastest period of economic growth? We started to have that fast period of economic growth in the early to mid-60s, just as that generation, the first part of that baby boom was entering the labor market. And for 30 years, we were expecting the same thing, that every year our labor market would still grow, we'd have more entrance to the labor market, fueling ever more growth, ever more consumption, ever more expansion, and things like education. But of course, the baby boom ended. And we only really felt that end in the early 80s and into the 90s, when that generation that kept increasing and entering the labor market actually began to slow down. So one thing to note is that the context in the term we use that we bandy about with regards to the baby boom is a bit of a misnomer. And again, this is something Professor David Foote always uh, remarked upon. The thing about baby booms is that if you're born just before one or at the beginning of one, you benefit disproportionately than if you're born at the end of one. If you were born in the 1930s, for example, in Canada, fine, you were a child during the Great Depression, but your parents probably suffered more than you. You didn't go to war, you were too young. You didn't fight in Korea either, you were still too young. And you entered the labor market when? Just at the time that economic growth was ramping up, born in the 1930s. Born in the early 40s, mid 40s, early 50s, you are still benefiting from that huge increase in investment that's tied to the birth rates of the past 20 or 30 years. And corporations are hiring, and you move pretty easily through corporate hierarchies as they existed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It's only when you come to that tipping point, the very end of a baby boom. You're still part of a generation of many, many births, but what's in your future? Well, there won't be another 30 universities built in Canada in the 18, 1980s and 1990s. Why? Birth rates have come down for the last 20 years, right from 1965 to about 1985, birth rates fell. So you're at the tail end of a baby boom. You're at the peak of a baby boom. You not only have lots of other people competing for you to get into university, to make the school team, to uh, enjoy some of the benefits of, of the life chances that you might have, you're not only competing against many people, but the economy is starting to change. It's not growing as fast. It's not generating the same kinds of economic opportunities that were generated earlier. And yet you're cast in the same light. You're still a baby boomer. So why aren't you succeeding? Why are you still living at home? So the expectations that need to be adjusted um, and which have to be uh, seen as part of an economic shift and not a sort of personal uh, fault in anyone's life is that once that baby boom and that demographic dividend works its way through, the expectation of high economic growth has to be put away. The expectation that you'll find a job easily and you'll settle into a pattern of life in which that life cycle of needs begins. You're borrowing for a house, you're uh, buying your first car, having your, your, your family, all gets sort of shifted and delayed. And for some, never comes at all. Um, a professor named Richard Easterlin wrote about this. His book was called Of Birth and Fortune. It came out in 1980. And he documented the life chances of people who were born at that peak of the baby boom or at the tail end of the baby boom were much lower than those born at the beginning, early part of the baby boom, and even after, during what's called the baby bust. Um, because of the baby bust, you benefit sort of from the expansion of all those opportunities for the peak of the baby boom, but you have much less competition. I'll take, give you a personal example. Uh, I was not a very good sports athletic person, but I could kind of skate and I was kind of tall. I made every team I applied, you know, jump four. I made every kind of uh, junior professional team well into my, my teens. And my brother, who was a much better athlete than me, never got out of house league. He was born 1964. Peak of the baby boom, 460 odd thousand people uh, born with him in his cohort. He's the generation X that Douglas Copeland talked about, the, the, the first generation that would have a lower standard of living than their parents. So he's a quote unquote boomer, but born at the tail end of the boom where his life chances were really affected by the number of people born in his cohort. And me, born at the trough, the bust, uh, with 300 odd thousand people born in my cohort, those numbers actually translate into individual life chances and differences. So one of the things we have to reframe around then is that with the end of the baby boom, the end of the dem demographic dividend, new realities are in order. Lower growth expectations, 
um, have to be sort of prevalent and the expectations you have about your labor market success also should be adjusted. Now this sounds very terrible, right? We have to accept less. Yes and no. Um, what you have to reframe around is the expectation concerning perhaps personal or private material success and what we should be focusing on. Um, and that is the social needs that will give rise during this period in which the baby boom generation enters their years of retirement. The profound shift in society to societal needs, collective goods, healthcare, better, more accessible cities, and all of these things are both opportunities and can have benefits for everyone in a society. These are the same problems, by the way, that plagued most economies in the 1930s. If it hadn't been for the kind of historical coincidence of World War II and the profound changes that happened in most Western industrialized countries as a result of World War II, we would probably be talking, have known about this much earlier. Let me give you a quote. So I'll end on this quote. This is John Maynard Keynes writing in 1937 on the economic consequences of a declining population. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, there was the similar kind of decline in birth rates and of course the fallout from the great crash, kind of parallel with what happened to us in 2008 with the great financial crisis. Here's Keynes's quote, the optimist in the sort of silver lining of lower growth. There will be many social and political forces to oppose this necessary change from an economic growth-oriented society to one that caters to our social needs. It is probable that we cannot make the changes wisely unless we make them gradually. We must foresee what it is that's before us and move to meet it halfway. If capitalist society rejects a more equal distribution of income and the forces of banking and finance succeed, then a chronic tendency towards the underemployment of resources, i.e. employment, um, will uh, must end, it must end the sap and destroy that form of society. However, if on the other hand there emerges a gradual evolution in our attitude towards private accumulation so that it shall be appropriate to the circumstances of a low growth economy and a stationary or declining population, we will be able perhaps to get the best of both worlds, maintain the liberties and independence of our present system whilst its more significant faults gradually suffer from diminishing importance. Um, and we can reorient society from a system of private accumulation towards one that puts it in its proper position in the greater social scheme. So I'm already over time, but all that is sort of Keynes trying to prepare society for a time in which economic growth, our expectations of private and material accumulation will be lessened. But so long as we understand that, we have to shift priorities in a society away from that towards social investments. So that's the end of my talk. No Beethoven or Beatles, but hopefully a silver lining in the dark clouds around us. Thank you very much.